What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Jam Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me as always is Mr. Brian Shows. Brian, let's talk about what everybody's been talking about, Brian. What I've been thinking about since I saw that episode. Let me tell you the story of how it all started. <laughs> X-Men is supposed to come out on Wednesdays, but I got home from work. I was tired. I needed a, I had a, a gig uh, the following day, and I just wanted to get my mind ready for that. <clears throat> and I said, I'll watch it in the morning. I got up early in the morning, got my stuff ready and all that. Saw the episode. I was speechless. I'm going to go out on a, I'm not even going out on a limb. This is, this is fair to say. This show Brian so far if it continues on its excellence this is an Emmy award winning show so follows referring to episode 5 of X-Men 97 a show which has delivered on the promise of being a worthy sequel to a classic um I don't have many notes for this show, to be quite honest. They're like so far, they're five for five. Like they're, they're, you know, obviously we'll talk about episode five in particular, but the show has not really had, in my mind, anything that I would characterize as like a, a major misstep or a wasted episode or um, a character that seems out of place. Um, I'm very pleased with what we've gotten. The nostalgia factor, it seems kind of just right. You know, like I think about like episode four, for example, like there clearly was right. Like they're having a little bit of fun, right? Jubilee's in the video game and you get to see some Street Fighter 2. It's like just enough that it's like, it's fun. Not so much that it's, why are we here? We're wasting time. But yeah, you get to episode five and episode five as of now, because that's, that's where we are in the show, stands as kind of like the transcendent episode of this series for some of the choices that were made. And I think also some of the performances, right? This is an animated show, but the voice acting and the way the characters interact, like, yeah, look, I, I loved it. I love the little things in it. I love the big things in it. Um, as I said, I am, I am, a, I am a very partial to Gambit. <laughs> he's, he's, he's one of my favorite... <laughs> Like not, you know, I, I don't know what you would call it. Like not, not Mount Rushmore characters, but like in all of comics, I, I just have always loved the character. So I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm a little sad <laughs> right now. But at least, at least if you're going to, spoiler alert, if you're going to take out a major character, like give him an exit. And he got an exit. Like that... That was pretty cool. So all of that, you know, I think I think works. But <clears throat> I'd be curious as to your reaction because I texted you a little bit about this. I think a lot of the reason why the end of the episode works as well as it does is because of the time we spend in conversations between Rogue and Gambit, right. Rogue and Magneto. and Magneto, Magneto and Gambit's history. Like that's what pays off when the fight comes. Before we get to the, the the end of it, there was one thing that I noticed, and the and it I wasn't thinking about the significance of the word until I remembered uh, the titles of the last two episodes of this season. There was this this particular. Mutant, Brian. He was clear. You could see his skeleton, his eyeballs, his guts, all that stuff. If you watch this episode again, watch him in particular, you see that he is being shown to you for a reason. Reason being is like, if you're thinking about it, I couldn't hang out with this guy. Whoever he is, she, I couldn't, I can't go to dinner with you. I'm sorry. You look crazy. Put on some clothes. You know what I'm saying? They did that purposely, Brian, because it was uncomfortable. All hell breaks loose. The aftermath occurs, and you see him again, and it doesn't bother me as much, probably. The word is tolerance, Brian. 
Think of the last two episodes and what the name of those two episodes are. I didn't, at, the, at that moment, I wasn't thinking about it. If you don't know, do you know the last two, the name of the last two? Tolerance is extinction. I found everything about this episode. Like I had, it took me a while to see it again because I wanted to get to the breakdowns of the show, uh, of, of, of the show to understand all the Easter eggs and all that other stuff. And then I watched it again. And Brian, it still hits you the same way in terms of what they were able to pull off. And when the action comes, Brian, the action is unbelievable. That is one thing Marvel Animation and the and the people behind the show, because the I, I have to say, not to be off too far, but the what if fighting is dope too. So they're doing a fantastic job in giving us action sequences. But Brian, what were some of your favorite parts of that uh, episode? Well, I remarked on this. I loved the exchange between Logan and Gene um, early in the episode. So they spend time on sort of, I guess, what do you want to call it? Real Gene? <laughs> Real Gene sort of reacquainting herself with herself and kind of reliving her own history, but almost as if she's never experienced it. And so there's this like, gulf between her and Scott now and you could see Logan as always torn between like this the woman he loves but he's kind of he he knows not to tread too close to the line yeah, he's a third wheel yeah yeah <laughs> and then she kisses him yeah and I I'm t- like that's to me what comes after is brilliant writing yeah. because she like kisses him and then she's like what did I and he's like you're Jean Grey, he's Scott Summers. Those are the rules. Ooh, you yeah. just forgot. Yeah, and I'm like, that's perfect. Yeah. Like, like, that's almost a fourth wall break, yeah. but it's not. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, and it's it's so perfect. And you see the anguish in his face as he kind of turns away. And I'm like, that, that's what makes the X-Men the X-Men. Brian, do you think she sort of recognizes at that moment. I mean, there's always been a thing between them two, but there's also this connection now between them because they both can't trust their memories. Yeah. There's some fairness to that. I think there's also like, she almost feels more of a kinship to him because his memory spans so long. Right. And, and, and like he, he predates all, he's kind of been there for, like, as she says, she's like, Oh yes, I forgot you were there. Like, and it was like a hundred years, it's like a hundred years earlier or whatever, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you were there. You don't need me to tell you what happened. You actually lived it. Um, I, I have to admit when, when the whole Madeline Pryor storyline became apparent, it was the one moment where I wavered a little bit on this show because I always feel like the Jean Grey mind trick is kind of the cheat code for X-Men stories sometimes, right? Whether it's Phoenix whether it's this, like they always kind of mess with her mind and that, and because she's so powerful, that kind of gives you this route into kind of Ambulance. disrupting, disrupting the X-Men. But then the, the second thing, like I said, it, it's the, it's the converse, it's Magneto manipulating and talking Rogue into assuming the role that he wants her to assume. And then her subsequent conversation with Gambit about it. Like that to me is... Like that's money right there. Everything about that where they're sitting together and, and she's basically complaining about her inability to lamenting her inability to touch him and he and he says, you know, it goes it, it's it's not it goes past skin deep, you know, and like there's real emotion. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care that these are animated like there's real emotion there. And I like I said to you, like the live action version of these characters that we have coming. Again, have an incredibly high standard to live up to to match the emotion you feel when you watch a scene like that. I don't think that'll be. I think we're gonna get two different. I, I think in, in attempting to do so, Brian will be. I don't think we're certainly gonna get that right. We're not gonna get that sort of drama, or you know, uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna see a show. Whatever that is, I don't know, but hopefully it's uh, entertaining, and, and and I don't think it'll be something that's quote unquote great, right? You know what? I, watching that scene though, watching this episode in these series of episodes leading up to sort of Gambit's bow, if you will, at the end, 
it makes me all the more perplexed he wasn't in the original live action version of this. And I, I get it, I'm partial to Gambit, but when Brian Singer and them did it, and it's, those are good movies. Don't get me. I'm not throwing. I'm not casting stones. It was what they did was hard, and it turned out really well. But there is a balance within these these characters where you need all of the relationships. And Gambit does hold multiple cards, pun intended, in terms of relationships that he's a part of because of his personality and his lady man, you know, kind of persona. But he's also his genuine affection. Um, for Rogue. So to not have him in the original live action, you, uh, watching this, I was like, yeah, that actually was missing. They focused on Logan, Gene, and Scott. That's kind of what they chose, you know, between Hugh Jackman, James Marsden, and Famke Jansen. But watching this, I was like, no, you need Gambit. So like, if they're going to do a new lineup, I I hope he's in there because I think he he's relevant beyond just his his powers. Certainly. The, th- the- the issue, the, the, the issue with that, Brian, and, and why they sort of didn't try to go that route in introducing that character in the live action was because they were Sweat and Wolverine, man. That was their number one thing that they wanted, and Magneto and Professor X, but everybody else was like, we just need them there, but we don't got to make them great. Like, there was Cyclops. You know, so right, yes, fair. Like he, he definitely took the the brunt of that. Ron, what did you think of uh, Scott cheating on on <laughs> on Jean? Oh, I think, it, like I said, I think it. I, I don't, like, I don't like condone it, obviously, but I liked it in the sense that this show does a good job of making Scott interesting. Like you, you feel his ups and downs in a way that, in some ways, I, I actually think. Uh, I think this show is doing it actually better than I remember the original show doing it. Oh, certainly. Because the original show at one point got in the mold, I felt like, of Scott's predominant role was he would just run to Gene every time Gene had like something pop into her head and he would just say, Gene, what's wrong? <laughs> like that kind of became his character a little bit. <laughs> and he did it this time again. And he did it. But at least <laughs> in this version, he's kind of got his own subplots and yeah, his yeah, own yeah. demons that he's kind of dealing with. And it, it does make him more dynamic, I think, which makes him more interesting. Um, so I, I'm liking this kind of version of Scott that's, Part part heroic leader, but part very conflicted and doing things, capable of doing things like this. He's very conflicted, and you saw him just burst out and say things that if Professor X would have been around, he would have been like Scott, what the hell, you know. <laughs> but uh, did you see the Watcher? Oh, I didn't notice that. I don't have to go back and watch it. Yeah, yo. Right before Cable shows up, right before okay. the, the thing very happens. Very briefly, you see him. You see, you see it. I saw it, but I didn't pay attention because of what was going on. I was more intrigued yeah. at that. Uh, but it was just, it was quick. But he, he's there, and, you're, and and every time you see him, you know something's about to go down. <laughs> I sort of knew, okay, something's about to happen. I didn't know. We don't know who he is referring to. Yeah, uh, it could be Apocalypse. It could be someone else. What did you think of that sequence? So you know what I thought about this entire sequence. This is how you do cameos. Right here. Because, yeah. right, there's a lot of mutants on Genosha. Oh, yes. As you said, you pointed out one that most people wouldn't notice. But it's like we get Emma Frost and Sebastian Shaw, make, you know, have a couple lines. We spend a little minute with them. They're treated as if you know who they are. Yeah. Right? And in general, if you're a fan, you would know and recognize most everyone who's in the room and who's participating. Uh, Kurt Wagner makes an appearance as well. But see, by the end of the episode, you're like, aha. They weren't just there to, like, tip the cap to the fans. They were there to be part of furthering what was about to happen on this island in, in their own way. And Cable, obviously, is the most direct example of that because he's time traveling and he literally pops up. And you're like, oh, that's Cable. And it's like, but Cable's there to deliver a very specific message and warning, which then becomes something you know, cataclysmic within seconds. Um, but even in that brief moment, he has that little exchange with Gene where it's sort of like parental or I don't know what, what you want to call it. And it's, you know. It they manage to steal. Yeah, they yeah, steal yeah, that yeah. little like yeah. five seconds, you know, to make it mean something. That's what I mean. Yes. Like these are not just like, hey, we drew the character so you could say he was in the show. That's what I mean by like, oh man, everyone, the way they just did everything, the way they put it together, Brian, and then every, and then all hell's break loose, right? Well, this show is not. This show 
is using violence almost like Shogun uses violence or almost like a really great drama uses violence, which is like it measures it and then makes sure that like any time we see the powers on display and the action sequence of the set piece, like it changes the narrative, like meaningfully. It's not just there so we can see our heroes do their thing. And, and, I, and this was far and away like raising the stakes of what that meant in this show. And this show, Brian, sort of speak, sort of speaks to some of the things that are going on in, in, our, in our reality, right? And the scenarios that could occur. And when they do their speeches, their speeches mean stuff. Yeah, they they mean something, especially to someone like myself, you know. The little things that they do, Brian, like for example, when Rogue is talking to Gambit and you see just her her hand on her arm, just talking about how she wishes to sort of be with Gambit, but she can't touch it. Those little gestures, you already know, like, like she wants to be with him, but she can't. And so you understand where she's coming from. And I don't know where the epiphany came from, came to her where she decided that she's not gonna take this role that Magneto has asked her to to take on and she'd rather be with Gambit but Gambit doesn't know that and so but that's very well, that's very Shakespearean though right yes yeah like that sequence and then of course yeah. the whole inability to touch him gets paid off with her final line of I can't feel you which <sighs> you know hurts 10 times more because of what they just said before Exactly, Brian. And then that cry, that little, that, that little, it was just, it was just icing on the cake when they did that little cry at the end. This show is, because we're picking up at the end of the original X-Men where Charles Xavier is in limbo, I don't know what you want to say, like he's, he's, he exists, but he's not present. I feel like so far this has been like a Cobra Kai of the series in the terms of Magneto's perspective, more often than not as being proven at least justified. I don't know if we want to go so far as to say as he's right, but the things he fears and the reasons that he operates the way he does, at least so far, generally have been paid off over and over again. Yeah. To where like, yeah, similar to Johnny Lawrence, you're kind of sitting there being like, man, that Charles <laughs> Xavier guy, he just holding him back. He's holding Magneto our real hero right. back. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why, from based on what... Uh, uh, these guys are saying on, on on the YouTube, he's gonna come back more evil than ever, and that's gonna be interesting to watch. Brian, I've heard also that if you thought this fifth episode was a gut punch, this ain't even it. You know? <laughs> well, we'll see. I mean, like I said, I mean that's the thing, right? So the other reaction, naturally, just knowing the structure of the show, is like when you see the way this episode ends, and then you're like okay, that was episode five. Like, that's normally the way you would end a season, right? I mean, if you wanted to cliffhang a whole season, that's what you would do. And you got five more episodes. That's what I'm saying. So you're like, okay, they they deliberately put it here, which means they know it's not the best they have in the quiver. One last thing, Brian, and then I'll, let, and then I'll ask you a question. Um, but the, the episode before this one with uh, Jubilee, uh, Brian, I was half watching it. Because it just didn't interest me. Oh, interesting. I, see, but but yeah. I'll tell you this. As I was sort of watching it, as soon as I heard the mood change, when I heard Storm's voice, everything else around me stopped and I was paying attention, Brian. Mm -hmm. Continue. I was just going to say, I think structurally, though, you have to evaluate that episode after having seen episode five, and then you understand episode four, the levity and the nostalgia in the video game reality, to me, makes more sense with the weight of what episode five does. That's why it's there. That's why it's placed there, to be a little bit... It, it matters, but it matters in a lighter sort of way, and it is meant mm -hmm. to make you smile and have a little fun because they're going to absolutely rip your heart out. And they know that, but you don't when you're watching it. So I got <laughs> let's talk about Gambit's death. Uh, okay, so, okay. Uh, I think there's some legitimate shock value to when he gets impaled. 
with the history you have with this show, when he comes charging in and he's talking his junk and he kind of leaps in the air and he gets stabbed like in that like quick manner, I think there's some legitimate shock value to that where you're like, yeah, yeah. wait, what? Like he really got stuck like that? He does get his final. I mean, that's that's what I love. When he charges, he's like, remember it. <laughs> Which is the name of the? I think it's one of the names of the episode. But like, yeah, yeah then he, it is. The then he name charges. Of the then he charges it up and, and saves the day. Like that is, as I said, if you're going to take a hero out, like that's that was how the hero that was that was his episode. That was his episode. That was Gambit's episode, sprinkled in with a lot of great stuff. I'll go back to the statement that I made before, Brian, and I want to know what you think about it. Could X Men be an Emmy award winning show? Yeah, well, there's a category for this, isn't there? Isn't there? Isn't is there it? an Emmy? Isn't there an Emmy that? that deals with animated i don't recall could it could be and if there I is there, i, I have no so, question yeah. but that, are that, you saying that could it win like for drama i don't think it will get the recognition in that regard but yeah, yeah I, I understand what you're saying yeah um, yeah i mean if there's a, if there's a if there is a category for animation that i would assume that this should win but haven't like the Simpsons won. Haven't they won like every year for, you know? That's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. The, I'm thinking of The Simpsons when I say that. Yeah. So there is a primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Animated Program. So, yeah. I will be watching for <laughs> that. If they can get a win or they can get a nomination, what we then want, if this thing will ever get off the ground, is we want them head to head with Cape Crusader one year and see who's actually better. Because there's two seasons of this, right? So season two of this opposite season one of Cape Crusader yeah, that would be something. That would be something. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Animation, man. Yo, I had a, I'll, I'll sign off after that. I tell you this story, Brian. This is an important story. I was having a conversation with a gentleman, and we were sort of just like, you know, we were in our presence and we had to be there for a while. So we were just talking it up, whatever, right? And I asked the question about do you watch. Um, some of these animated movies and stuff like that. And the gentleman said, I don't because I'm not a kid. Uh. And I was like, oh, okay. If you're saying that animation is for kids, then conversation is over regarding everything else, right? Because that's how close-minded some people can be. But this show right here, the <clears throat> the X Men animated series, and there's a bunch of other shows, Castlevania, Blue Ass Samurai, that's that do uh, amazing things with their storytelling. Yeah. But to do it with, and, and it's not to say that it couldn't be done, Brian, but they just keep elevating the bar of what storytelling, right? Of, of, of what relationships, and and you're right. The moments that they spend talking are just one of the best moments because what they pay it off with the act because you know they're gonna get into something, right? Even Cyclops said it, yo. We've saved you from aliens, <laughs> and it's true. We're like, yo, these dudes get into some craziness. So, X Men '97. I hope, and I'm pretty sure. My only concern, Brian. Is Apocalypse. But Apocalypse to me, he was sort of like a mayor humdigger type of character in the X-Men. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully that is better. But we'll see. Let us know in the comment section below what you guys thought of the X-Men 97 episode 5 and what you think of the X-Men series so far. Hit that like and subscribe button and let your friends know and because... X-Men 97, Brian, is is the way people talk about it, Brian. It leaves you in in a pondering state. Yeah, well, as to your point about the prior conversation, basically walk up, walk up to your friends, present them with the red pill and the blue pill. And if they give the response that that gentleman gave you, hand them the blue pill and say, thank you very much. Yeah. And if they don't, you hand them the red pill and you say, we'll see where the rabbit hole goes. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Jim Report. The show goes on! Yeah!